Okay, so we are getting started with chapter five, um, which has a lot of, again, I, I, I'm not in love with how this book is organized. It has a lot of information in it. You'll notice when you go into the chapter five folder, there's, there's quite a few worksheets. Um, there's a lot of practice for this. So we've got double displacement reactions, which you know for intro chem, I think is the hardest one that we cover. Um, and then there's some redox in here. There's oxidation states and reducing agents, and that also can be problematic. Um, and then we learn about the conversion factor that we need for solutions, which is molarity. So we have to go through that. And then we have to understand titration um, reactions and the stoichiometry in those types of experiments, which is actually what the lab is looking at this week. So there's, there's quite a bit of content here um, and there's a, quite a bit of worksheets. <laughs> So there's a lot there to keep you busy. I posted a lot of videos, again, a lot on double displacement, a lot on um, single displacement. So there's a lot there to keep you busy. If you have any questions as you go through it, please let me know. Um, and as you know, we, we move quickly. So we're gonna finish chapter five today and then that will be due that credit quiz. It's it, not to be confusing, it's credit quiz four because it's our fourth credit quiz, but it's in the chapter five folder and it'll be due um, a week from today at 11.59 p.m. All right, so um, first thing is that molarity that I had mentioned, right? That is our conversion factor that we need for solutions when we do any kind of stoichiometry. So when we first started talking about stoichiometry, I had mentioned, you know, we've got um, four different phases when we write our chemical equations, right? Well, we're familiar with solid, liquid, gas, but then we have solutions. And so for dealing with a solution, which is usually marked AQ for aqueous in water, although it doesn't have to always be in water, but intro chem, that's usually what we've got, that we need some way of understanding, okay, the, the solute, which is the part that's dissolved in the water, right? That solute, like let's say it's a sodium chloride solution, the sodium chloride is the solute. If we're doing a reaction with that solution, we're not concerned about the water, the solvent, we are concerned with the sodium chloride. Maybe we're doing a precipitation reaction with silver. Silver and chloride love to make a precipitate. So when we use that salt water solution, the salt is just coming in with the water, but the water is not part of the reaction. It's the salt that we really want to pay attention to. So we need some kind of concentration term that tells us, hey, if you use this volume of that solution, this is how much sodium chloride is present. And then we can do our stoichiometry. And as we know, mole is always the center point. So for a chemist, our favorite concentration term is molarity. And a lot of times it's just abbreviated with a capital M and it stands for moles per liter. And technically it is the moles of the solute. You know, if we go back to that example, it'd be the moles of sodium chloride in the liter of solution that I use. So moles per liter. So when we start looking at our stoichiometry, right, what we always like to do, at least in my opinion, is you start with the measurement, which is either going to be a volume or a mass. For a, for a solution, it makes sense we're going to measure the volume that we use, not the mass, right? Solids, we do mass, right? So if we know the volume of that solution, if we want to take it to the moles of the solute inside, that's where that molarity will come in as our conversion factor. So molarity. I, I think of stoichiometry like a flip book, um, like for little kids where you have like one, two, three, four little flip books and you have to write a sentence and it's like the frog. And then if you flip it, it's a cat, whatever. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I think of stoichiometry that way, which may sound really silly, but when we're doing a conversion, it's like, okay, what do I flip to to do this first conversion? So we learned that if we have mass of a solid, we use molar mass from the periodic table. Now what we're gonna have is the volume of a solution, so we use the molarity. Now the thing about this conversion factor is it's not always the same number like molar mass, right? That's a constant from the periodic table. Molarity is gonna depend on the solution that we're using. Molarities can be anything from 0. 0.00008, you know, like a really small value to a, a, a very high value, like 12.6. So the molarity has to, be given to you in the question. So a lot of times solution problems will appear to be a bit more complicated because both the volume and the molarity are gonna be given to you in the question. So you're gonna have more numbers that you have to pay attention to and figure out how to put them together. All right, then we've got, uh, we talked about solute, solvent, dilute and concentrated. That's, those are just relative terms, right? I think we're familiar with that. If we dilute something, we're adding water. We'll do that when we do dilution problems here in a little bit. 
And if a concentration, or sorry, if a solution is dilute, that means there's a lot of water, not a lot of solute. If it's concentrated, that means there's a lot more solute and maybe not as much water. Um, but anyway, that, those are just relative terms. They don't really give you much information. So molarity, like I mentioned, this is the center point, um, or this is our way of getting to the center point, sorry, to the mole when we deal with solutions. Now, there are a lot of concentration terms. When you start Chem 2, you start learning about volume percentages. We've, we've done mass percentages. There, um, there's mole fractions. There's mole percentages. There's lots of different concentration terms. But for a solution, a chemist, the favorite is molarity, of course, because it's got moles in it. So just to kind of start looking at how molarity is calculated, if we want to figure out how the, the molarity of this solution is 3.00 moles of Ki, the Ki, this would be the solute, all right, and then the solution, right, but the Ki is what's being dissolved into the solution. So a couple of questions just came into the chat. You should be able to review your test one submission without using honor lock. Um, when you take the test, obviously you have to use honor lock, but there should be a way for you to go in and click on your test one submission. And there, um, you can also Google that like on the My Courses, how to review a graded quiz. But I think I posted that also in one of the folders, maybe in the Start Here folder. So you can look at your test and, and review it. Um, and then the test one average I haven't calculated yet, I don't curve, um, so that uh, those are the questions that have come up so far. Just remember though that your lowest test is replaced by your score on the final exam. So if this test didn't start out quite as you might have hoped, um, just you know talk with me about how to fix it moving forward, how to either what how to spend your time. It's or I don't know how whatever discussion you want to have, um, and then as long as the remaining exams have higher scores, then the test one score will go away. All right, so. Those were just some questions that came in. Sorry to get off topic. So the, the molarity here, right? if we're finding molarity, we know that we need moles divided by liters. That's what the formula for molarity is. Um, so we have our 3.00 moles of the solute, which in this case is the potassium iodide. And we're dissolving that into 2.39 liters of solution. So this one here starts out real simple. We're just doing a simple division and we're keeping track of our sig figs and we get 1.26 molar. That, that's the abbreviation if you wanna just put a capital M. If you wanna put moles per liter, that's also okay. Either one works. Um, and so that would be our concentration of this potassium iodide um, solution. And what's nice about that is if, if I then go and do a, a reaction with this solution, I know that if I use a liter, I have 1.26 moles of Ki there. If I use two liters, then I have uh, 2.52 moles of Ki. So that is our way of sort of determining, okay, if I use this volume of this solution, how many moles are present? Now, the next one for B, it says we wanna know the molarity of a solution that has 0.522 grams of HCl and 0.592 liters of solution. So again, since we're finding molarity, we need moles per liter. Now we don't have moles. We have 0.522 grams of HCl, and that's being dissolved into 0.592 liters of solution. And so when you look at that, you still want to put your amount of solute on the top and the amount of the solution on the bottom, and then think about, okay, I need my, my units to be moles per liter. So I'm going to have to change grams of HCl to moles. And that should look familiar. We're gonna use the molar mass from the periodic table. So if I add up a hydrogen, which is 1.01, 35.45 for the chlorine, I get 36.46 for the molar mass of the HCl. So that I'm just pulling right from the periodic table. We've canceled out grams and now we have moles. So I'm gonna take 0.522, divide that by 0.592, and then divide that by 36.46. And to three significant figures, I have 0 0.0242. Again, if you want to abbreviate with just capital M, you can. Or if you prefer to write out moles per liter, you can also do that. They, they're the same thing. So that is our concentration of that HCl solution. All right. So in both of those first two examples, we were trying to determine the molarity of the solution. So when you're finding the molarity of the solution, you really want to think about your formula which is moles divided by liters. That's what you have to do for finding the molarity. What's gonna change now in C is it says how many grams, question? 
Yeah. Um, I thought for when you're finding the molarity, if you're giving grams, I thought you had to convert it to moles first and then divide it by liters. It doesn't matter. You can do it that way if you prefer. So some students do it that way. They'll do the 0.522 divide by 36.46, get the moles answer, and then divide that by 0.592 and you'd get the same answer. So if that's more comfortable, you can do it that way. Okay. Um, I think I got something different. Uh, okay. Never mind. I, I input it into my calculator wrong. Okay. All right, I'm Sorry. just gonna type my, no, 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 don't worry. I'm gonna type it in again real quick. Cause I, yeah, okay. So, so you got 0.0242? Yeah, I accidentally missed a number and then I got 0 0.008 something. Oh, so you're like, it doesn't work both ways. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, okay, so for both A and B, we're finding molarity. So if the question is asking you, what is the molarity? Make sure you think about the formula. You need the moles of solute divided by the liters of solution. In the first example, that's what we were given, so it was pretty easy. In the second example, this goes back to Anna's question, we had a mass, so we had to make sure and convert that mass to moles using molar mass. And then we still have moles divided by liters, and so we get our molarity that way. C though, question C is gonna be very different because now it's asking us for grams of KOH that we would need to make two liters of a six molar KOH solution. So what I want you to recognize here that's different is now molarity is given to you. We're not being asked for it, it's actually given to us. And so now if I slide this back down real quick, now we're thinking about this type of conversion of starting with the volume of our solution and going to moles using molarity as a conversion factor. Rather than using the formula, we wanna think about using dimensional analysis. And this is where that flip book comes in. So when I do the stoichiometry questions and I'm you know, trying to kind of convert from one unit to another, I always think, okay, start with the measurement. For a chemist, that's usually mass or volume. So I kind of keep it simple. So in this case, we're gonna start with volume. And then you flip, right? What conversion factor do I need to get where I need to go? And we know we always have to go to moles. So if this had been two grams and we had to go to moles, we would know molar mass, right? But this is liters. And because it's a solution, the molarity is what's gonna help us get to moles. So that's what we wanna sort of, how we wanna approach this. So I'm gonna write a little note. So my little note here says, if you are given molarity, use it as a conversion factor. So we don't wanna start with molarity. I mean, technically you can, A times B is the same as B times A, but I don't like the way it looks in dimensional analysis. So I always like to start with the volume or the mass. All right, so we've got a volume here. So start with volume. So we have 2.00 liters. And then when we set up our conversion step, right, we know liters has to go on the bottom. And if in doubt, right, we always wanna to go to moles, right? That's, that will never steer you wrong. All right, so moles per liter, that's what that capital M stands for. And I've had some students, lots of students in the past that whenever they see that capital M, they just go ahead and write it as mole per liter. And that helps them recognize that really what that, that this, what I highlighted is saying is that there are 6.00 moles of KOH per liter of solution, where that, that per, right, is an equivalence line. We talked about that with density. So there are six moles equal to one liter used. So when I go to put this into a conversion factor, I know equals, right, my equivalence line is the same as this equivalence line here in the conversion factor. So on the bottom, one with liter, and on the top, 6.00 moles, technically KOH, but since we're not changing substances, we don't really have to put that in. It's not like we're doing stoichiometry of an A and a B. It's just KOH here. Um, but we want one more step because we need grams. So we need to get rid of KOH moles on the bottom. We want grams of KOH on the top and grams per mole like we saw before, like we're familiar with, right? That's our molar mass from the periodic table. So if I go to my periodic table, potassium 39.1, oxygen 16, hydrogen 1.01, I get 56.11 for the molar mass of the KOH. So now if I multiply that by 12 and I keep three significant figures, I get 673 grams of KOH. 
So what I would do is I would take 673 grams of KOH, dissolve it into two liters of solution, and that would give me a concentration of six molar. All right, um, one other question about the test came in. The bonus, I went over this in the review, the bonus quiz is a separate grade. It's not added to the test score, it's just in a separate column. And my reason for doing that is when the end of the semester comes and let's say test one is your lowest test and that ends up being replaced by the final, this way, because the bonus points are kept separate, you don't lose the bonus points. They just stay in the grade book as bonus points. So that's why they're two separate scores. Um, so even if the test one is your lowest score and it gets replaced, you don't lose the bonus points, which is nice. <laughs> All right, um, let's see. So we've gone through molarity. First two calculations, solving for molarity. Second calculation, which is gonna be really familiar with uh, stoichiometry by the end of today, is using that molarity as a conversion factor. So if you're given molarity, just I want you to immediately think, okay, conversion factor, that M stands for moles per liter, right? And we're gonna use it somewhere in this setup to go to moles, right? So we start with volume, we go to moles using molarity, and then molar mass will get us to grams. All right, so test questions I'll have to do at the end of today. Sorry, I just, I'm seeing some more test questions come in, but when I, let me get through chapter five and then I can take any questions that you have about the test. All right, so dilution, dilution questions come up when it says something like, um, all right, you're taking a 12 molar hydrochloric acid, you wanna dilute it down to maybe a one molar solution. You need a hundred mils of that one molar solution. How much of the concentrate should you use? So what you, what you kind of recognize here is that this is not a stoichiometry question. What you'll have for dilution is there will only be one substance. So it'll say something like you've got a 12 molar HCl, you wanna make it into a two molar HCl. So the substance doesn't change. And the reason why that's important is because it means it's not a chemical reaction, in which case we don't need to worry about a mole ratio, right? Going from moles of A to moles of B. So when it's a dilution problem, we just have to remember this formula, which is M1V1 equals M2V2. And M is obviously for molarity and V is volume. And what this is saying is, is that if I add volume, right, if I add water um, to dilute it, the concentration goes down. So keeping both sides equal, if one goes up, the other goes down. And what's also important to sort of see here is that if you took moles per liter times liter, you get moles. So what the formula is saying is that the moles of solute are not changing, which is true, right? If I just add water, the amount, let's say it's the KOH solution. If I add water, the amount of KOH that's in there hasn't changed. I've just add the, added the water. So if I add the water, the molarity decreases, but the moles of KOH stays the same. So that's what this formula allows us to do is to convert from a concentrated solution to a dilute solution or you know, how, whatever the question is asking for. Um, but the moles of the solute are not changed. So if we go to page two and look at this example, it says how many milliliters of a 10.15 molar NaOH stock solution would be needed to make 15 liters of a 0.315 molar NaOH solution. So again, what you wanna recognize here is that there's just one solution. Um, one substance, right? Sorry, not one solution, one substance. So going back to what I said, there's no, there's no chemical reaction here. There's no moles of A going to moles of B. This is just taking a concentrated NaOH, right? High molarity and diluting it. And we just wanna play around with that. Okay, so we got this stock solution, really concentrated, about 10 molar. How much of that should I take to dilute down to 15 liters to get the concentration to 0.315? So obviously a very small amount, but that's what we're gonna calculate. So we have our formula M1V1 equals M2V2. So again, when you see that it's only one substance, you know it's a dilution problem. And then you can pick your pairs because there's always that of, right? So we're looking for a volume. So V1 will be my unknown of a molarity of 10.15 molar. So there's my first set. V1 is unknown, M1 will be my 10.15. And then I've got a V2 of 15 liters and an M2 of 0.315. So again, these two go together because you get the of that's linking them together. So my starting concentration is 10.15 molar. I don't know what volume of that I'm gonna use. So V1 will be my unknown. 
Uh, my target molarity M2, I want 0 0.315, and I need 15.0 liters of that. So now we just, you know, plug and chug, right? So we're going to divide both sides by 10.15 molar. All right, the molarity unit cancels out. Um, and then if I solve for volume, I'm going to just take 0 0.315, multiply that by 15 liters, and then divide by 10.15. And we go with least sig figs. That means we're going to have three, and I get 0.466. And the unit here that I'm left with is the same unit that I started with for volume, which is liters. And just a quick note here, you don't have to be in liters. If this had been in milliliters, that would have been fine. Our answer would have just then been in milliliters. So you don't have to change the volume units when you're using the dilution formula. The only stipulation is, is that the volume units have to be the same, All right? So that's the only thing you have to be careful with in order for them to, you know, cancel out technically. All right, so we only need about half a liter of that concentrated stock solution to make 15 liters of the 0.315 molar. All right, so that's dilution. Now, aqueous solutions, right? That's what this will be focusing on. Aqueous, we've, we've been sort of starting to see that. That's when it's marked AQ, meaning in water, aqua, right, in water. Um, and what we are going to focus a lot on, to me, this is like nomenclature applied. So we learned about ions and how they come together to make ionic compounds. Well, the reason why we focus on ionic compounds now is because they love to dissolve in water <laughs> for the most part. So a lot of our reactions in water are going to be ionic compounds. So we have to go back and remember all the things that we, we learned for nomenclature, the charges of our ions. We're also gonna learn solubility rules. Some compounds dissolve really well, some compounds don't. We're familiar with that, right? Salt dissolves pretty well, sugar doesn't, that kind of thing. Um, so when an ionic compound dissolves in water, the ions dissociate, which means the cation and the anion break apart. And the example that I've got here is the salt, the sodium chloride. So this is almost like a reverse of nomenclature. When we were making compounds, we made sure the charge is balanced. Well, now we're breaking the compounds up. So sodium chloride, when it dissolves in water, the sodium ions dissociate, which means they break apart from the chloride ions. Now ions in solution have to carry a charge. If they're not part of a compound, right? Because in a compound, the charges are canceled out and gone to zero. But when the ions are separate, the charge has to be in there because sodium with no charge is sodium metal, right? And that is not soluble in water, right? So you have to make sure the charges are on there. Just like chlorine with no charge is chlorine gas, right? And so again, not soluble in water. So when you're talking about an ionic compound dissolving in water, make sure you have the charges on there when the ions are by themselves. Now, an electrolyte, you know, we're familiar with that term, like with Gatorade and things, an electrolyte to a chemist just means an ionic compound that dissolves in water. Because this solution of sodium chloride would be electrolytic, which means the ions that are present can conduct an electric current, all right? So weak electrolytes just means that there's not a lot of ions present, Whereas a strong electrolyte means there's going to be a lot of ions present. Now, how it, whether it's strong or weak depends on a lot of factors, one of which is going back to molarity, how concentrated is the solution, right? If it's a highly concentrated solution, it's, it's good, if it's an ionic compound, it's going to have a lot of ions present. If it's not as concentrated, won't have as many ions. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, is this is something we get into a lot in Chem 2 which is some things dissociate 100%, some things dissociate like 20%, and some things dissociate like 0.02%, in fact, even much less than that. And Chem 2 spends a lot of time on equilibrium. You're given equilibrium or K constants to look at. And so we don't dive too deep in it here, but if it comes up, when you have a strong acid like HCl, HCl 100% dissociates into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. Sodium chloride, strong electrolyte, 100% dissolves for the most part, as long as you haven't reached the solubility limit. Now, HF is of the halogens, the only binary acid that is a weak acid. It's not one of the six strong acids. 
So when it dissociates, which it does do, it just doesn't do it to 100%. It's not 100% forward. Acetic acid is another one. It doesn't 100% go to the right. Now, for now, I feel like it's because we are not getting into those K values, the equilibrium values until chem two, I don't think we really need to focus on whether or not this acid dissociates when we do ionic equations or not. We're just gonna say that they do, unless it's something that's insoluble, which we'll talk about when we get there. But what I just wanna point out is, is that if this reaction is not 100% forward, that means we're not producing a ton of ions, which means it's a weak electrolyte rather than a strong electrolyte. But again, we don't need to worry about that, I don't think, until chem two. Chem two is when that comes up. Now, a non-electrolyte. Non-electrolyte means there's no ions. That makes sense, right? Because there's nothing to carry the electric current, and we need the ions to do that. So a non-electrolyte would be something that doesn't dissolve in water um, or something that doesn't have ions that still dissolves in water. And the perfect example that in this one is, is sucrose, right? So sugar which is C12H22O11, right, sucrose. That dissolves in water, as we know, not, not very well, but it does. But there's no ions there. It's not an ionic compound. There's no metal and non-metal or metal and polyatomic ion. That's just, that is a covalent compound, right? Just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, non-metals only. So yes, it dissolves in water, but not very well. But when it does dissolve, it doesn't do so by dissociation. Um, so it's not like this breaks apart into ions because there are no ions. So that's why that would be considered a non-electrolyte. Now, reactions in aqueous solution. The big one here is a double displacement reaction. And these are reactions that produce precipitates. Right? And precipitate is a fancy word for an insoluble solid, meaning when you mix these solutions together, two solutions, you're gonna see something opaque form. And that's, that's the precipitate. So the generic formula for double displacement is you have an AB, which is an ionic compound dissolved in water. All right, so let me actually rewrite it down below. I wanna make sure it's clear. So you have AB in solution in water, where A is your cation, B is your anion and you react it with another ionic compound, CD, that's dissolved in water. And what you predict, this makes sense, is that you would put the positive A with the negative D, and you would put the positive C with the negative B. And one of these possibly would form a precipitate or a PPT. Now, the only way for us to know that is by uh, looking at what are called the solubility rules. Um, so in TRO, it's table 5.1, but I also posted in the chapter five folder, I've got the solubility rules, right? And if this is not something you memorize, this will be given to you on the test. So the, what the solubility rules tell you is that like the rules are in order of dominance. So rule one is it trumps rule seven. So it says salts containing group one metals like sodium are always soluble. Ammonium too. Ammonium is the NH4 plus polyatomic ion. Now it says down here for number seven, sulfates are mostly soluble except for calcium, barium, lead, silver, strontium, which are insoluble. So soluble means it will dissolve in water. It would be aqueous. Insoluble means it doesn't dissolve and it would be a precipitate. So if I keep going, right, it says carbonates are insoluble. But the way that this is written, just so we understand, if it's sodium with carbonate, that's going to be soluble because sodium is always soluble. If it's like lead too with carbonate, now it's going to be insoluble. So they're always written in, in, in level of dominance. So rule one always trumps rule 10, et cetera. So we're going to be looking back and forth at this when we go through our double displacement reactions as we start doing some examples, but that will be provided on the test. So don't worry about memorizing that. So here's some examples. All right, for these, we're going to first predict whether or not a reaction should occur looking at the solubility rules. That's, that's how we're going to decide that. And if it, something does occur, then we want to then write the balanced equation. All right, so when I look at my first compound, this is why I have you memorize your polyatomics. I've got my cation here, which is sodium plus one, and my anion is the nitrate polyatomic NO3 minus one. 
And my second compound, I've got magnesium, group two alkaline earth metal, plus two charge, and the sulfate polyatomic ion, negative two. All right, so when I start to look at how this is going to form, like what products will be formed, Again, I'm not going to put sodium and magnesium together because those are two positives and that doesn't make sense. Same for nitrate and sulfate. So what I'm going to do first is put the sodium with the sulfate. So if I think about my charges, sodium is plus one, sulfate is negative two, so it has to be Na2SO4 to balance charges. Then my other compound here will be magnesium plus two with the nitrate minus one. So crisscrossing here, I need two nitrates to balance out the magnesium. Now, in order for me to understand whether or not a reaction occurs, I'm gonna go and look at my solubility rules. Now, again, rule one, if it's got sodium, it's soluble, no matter what, because that's rule number one. So anytime you see sodium, you know it's gonna be soluble, which means you're gonna put aqueous. Now for the second compound, I'm looking for magnesium or nitrate. Now, most of the rules are gonna be about the anion, not anything specifically about magnesium, but let's look. Rule number two says salts containing nitrate are soluble. So that means this nitrate, right? Also always soluble. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we started with two ionic compounds dissolved in water. And when we mix them together, I have ionic compounds that are still just dissolved in water. So in terms of a chemical change, there wouldn't be one here. There would be no evidence of a chemical change. Basically, we've got ions floating around in solution. And they're just, it happens that they start out in separate solutions, right? Separate test tubes. I put the two test tubes into one and I still have all those ions just floating around in solution. So because nothing formed a solid, that means no reaction occurred. So for this one, we would just put NR, no reaction, nothing happened, no precipitate, right? So we won't worry about balancing that one because we don't have to, because nothing happened there. So let's go to the second one. The second one, I've got iron three chloride and sodium sulfide. Now the type two cation, like we did in nomenclature, that's why I feel like this is nomenclature part two, we can only figure out the charge on iron by knowing our chloride, right? Now, when I look at chlorine, this is not a polyatomic ion. So the subscripts become really important here. If I go back up, nitrate in part A is NO3. That three is part of nitrate. So it has to stay locked in place. Just like the four is part of sulfate. It has to stay put. But this iron chloride compound is binary. There's no polyatomic ion there. So I want to look at one single iron and one single chloride. Now, when I look at the periodic table, I know chloride being a halogen is a minus one charge. Now, because there are three of them present, that is giving me the charge on the iron. So I know the iron here is a positive three. So those are my two ions, the sodium and the sulfide. Sodium, group one metal, so I know it's a plus one charge. Again, that two subscript is not a polyatomic ion two, so it doesn't stay in place. And then the sulfur in the oxygen family, negative two charge. So when you look at your ions, ions by themselves should always be singular unless they are polyatomic. So when you write your ions, they have to either look exactly like they would from the periodic table, just a single with a charge, right? Or they're gonna be polyatomics from your polyatomic ion page. So I have iron three and chloride, and I have sodium and sulfide. When I come over to the product side, I'm going to put the iron three with the sulfide, right? Positive with negative. Now the charges don't change. So it's still iron three with the sulfide, but I need to make new subscripts to make the charge balance, right? So if we crisscross here, it would have to be Fe2S3. The other compound is the sodium, which is plus one, and the chloride, which is minus one. So that one doesn't need any extra subscript help because those charges are already balanced. Now, like we saw before, anytime you've got sodium, it's gonna be aqueous. This is always going to be soluble. So the only one we have to worry about is the iron three sulfide. So when I look, there's a rule about sulfides, number nine, that says most sulfides of transition metals are insoluble, right? Including iron. 
Insoluble means we've got a solid. So this one here, the iron three sulfide, that would be our solid because this one is insoluble. All right, so that means that this one would have a reaction. So if we were in lab and we took a solution of iron three chloride and mixed it with a solution of sodium sulfide, immediately we would see that precipitate form. We would see some kind of colored compound form in our test tube and we would be able to see that new matter being formed. So that would be a chemical change. So we do have to balance this one, right? <clears throat> now, when I go to balance, when you do double displacement, you predict your products first based on the ions that are coming together, put new subscripts as needed to balance out your charges. But when I go to now balance both sides of the equation, I'm gonna be using coefficients in front for balancing, right? So this is kind of the step-by-step -step process. <clears throat> when you look at your two ionic compounds, first identify your ions, singular ions, unless they are polyatomic. Once you have your ions, predict your products, A with D, C with B, putting new ions together, so new charge balance. So new subscripts to make new compounds. Now the last step is to balance both sides of the arrow with the coefficients in front. And there's not a perfect way always to do this, but with double displacement reactions, what I have found is if there's a product that needed extra subscripts for charge balance to make that compound work, that's usually where I then begin to look at my mass balance. So for example, I needed two irons to make this iron three sulfide come together. So I check and on the reactant side, I only have one iron. So I'm gonna put a two in front of FeCl3. <clears throat> I needed three sulfurs to make this compound work, but on the reactant side, I only have one. So in front of sodium sulfide, I'm going to put a three. So there's my three sulfurs and my two irons coming together to make that precipitate. Now, when I look at sodium, two times three, I've got six total on the reactant side. Chloride, three times two, so a total of six chlorines. So for the sodium chloride on the product side, I need to put a six and that balances out that reaction. All right, one more to do here. I've got barium nitrate. So barium group two alkaline earth metal positive two charge with nitrate polyatomic ion NO3 negative one, sodium Na plus one, and then sulfate polyatomic SO4 negative two. So again, just kind of paying attention because this is the hard part <clears throat> is that the subscripts that I'm highlighting are subscripts that are locked in place because they are part of the polyatomic ion. So you can never move those. They always have to stay with their polyatomic ion unit. If I get rid of that four, it's not sulfate. I don't know, it's not anything we recognize, right? So the four has to stay there. But that two subscript on the sodium is just balancing the sulfate charge. That two subscript on the nitrate is just balancing the barium charge. But when I go to the product side and I put new ions together, I need new subscripts, right? So charge balance subscripts, they don't carry over, right? We're not gonna carry over the two on the sodium. We're just gonna make sure and carry over the four for the sulfate. So the first product I would predict, barium with sulfate, since barium is positive two and sulfate is negative two, that's balanced. We don't need anything else there. And sodium is plus one with nitrate, which is minus one. So again, we don't need anything else there. So those are actually balanced without any help from any extra subscripts. Now, again, in terms of solubility, we know sodium is always aqueous, always soluble. So we don't have to worry about the sodium. The barium sulfate says most sulfates are soluble, but some exceptions here, right? Barium is one of those. So barium sulfate is insoluble. So the barium sulfate insoluble means that this is going to be the solid. And that's going to be, again, the fancy word is the precipitate, the PPT. All right, so this one would have evidence of a chemical change. Barium sulfate is a white milky precipitate. So I would have two colorless solutions. I would mix them together. And all of a sudden, I'd see this white you know, kind of chalky substance appear. All right, so I would see evidence of a chemical change. Now to balance, we didn't need any subscripts here on the product side, so it, it won't work like the iron and the sulfur that we did above. So that now we're gonna look and set up the reactant side and just sort of look, we've got one barium on both sides. I have two nitrate groups with the barium on the reactant side. On the product side, there's only one nitrate. 
So I need to multiply the sodium nitrate by two. So on the product side, I'm gonna put a two in front of NaNO3. And then if I look at the sodium, I've got two sodiums on the reactant side with the sulfate. And I, that two also goes to the sodium. So I've got two sodiums on the product side, one sulfate group, one sulfate group. So now we've got a balanced equation. All right, so of those three equations that we just did, I just wanna highlight A, right, had no reaction. For B and C, we would see a precipitate. So those would have evidence of a chemical change. All right, now for those double displacement reactions, what we were kind of getting used to is looking at the ions and the compound, predicting what the two compound products will be that are formed, looking at our solubility rules to decide which one's the solid, and then balancing both sides of the equation. So what we did for these three, well, two examples that formed a precipitate is we gave the balanced molecular equation. Now, unfortunately, I have to say, this was like one of my least favorite parts of Chem 1, that for double displacement reactions that form a precipitate, you can also write, for the same reaction, mind you, you can write a balanced molecular equation, you can write a total ionic equation, and you can write a net ionic equation. And I remember thinking, boy, this seems a little redundant because it's the same reaction. So why are we doing this? But you know, as you kind of dissect it, you're like, okay, I, I kind of see the point of it. And I'll explain that as we go. But it does, I have to admit, it does seem a little redundant. All right, so here's an example. I've got zinc sulfate and barium chloride. And so this one says for these, this reaction, predict the products and balance, just like we did for the first three. But now let's look at the complete or total and net ionic equations. So we're going to be looking at all three different types of equations for the same reaction. So that's, there's the redundancy. It's the same reaction, but we can write it three different ways. So first thing is always, and this I'm going to kind of go through this one step by step by step. When it comes to double displacement reactions, I think your first job is always to look at what your ions are. All right, and that's where we always started. We know zinc on the diagonal is always a positive two charge. And then that sulfate is a polyatomic SO4 negative two. So when you look at your ions, only keep the subscripts that are polyatomic ions. All right, so what I mean by that is the four, right? Like I highlighted earlier, that four is part of sulfate. So you can't drop that. That has to always be locked in place because that's our polyatomic. When I look at the barium chloride, we know barium group two alkaline earth metal plus two charge. And then the chloride here, that two subscript is not a polyatomic. This is a binary compound. So that two subscript is just balancing charges. So that, that's the one that we drop. We don't look at that when we're looking at just an individual ion. So we have zinc ion, sulfate ion, barium, and chloride. So when you look at your ions, right, they need to be singular, except if they're polyatomics. That's the only exception. So when I go to the product side, this is going to be step two. All right, so we're going to predict products. All right, with new subscripts, right, for new charge balance. All right, so what I mean by that is I'm going to put the zinc, which is still positive two, with chloride, which is negative one. So if this were a nomenclature question and I said, hey, give me the formula for zinc chloride, this isn't what you would give me. You wouldn't say ZNCl. You would crisscross, right, and come up with ZNCl2, right? So new subscripts as needed, looking at what the charge balance will be for that compound. The second compound we've got is barium, which is plus two, and sulfate, which is negative two. All right, don't need any help there. Those, those charges are already balanced, so that one's done. So now I need to go step three and check to see which one is aqueous and which one is the solid, All right? So I go to my solubility rules. So the zinc chloride, let's do that one first. There's nothing on here about zinc. So I see something here about chloride salts, which just means ionic compound containing chloride, generally soluble. Exception is silver, lead, and mercurous. Zinc is not on that exception list. So zinc chloride should be soluble. 
So soluble means aqueous, right? So zinc chloride will be just still dissolved in solution. The barium sulfate we saw earlier in the last example, barium sulfate is insoluble. Insoluble means that's gonna be our precipitate, right? So we figured out what the precipitate was. That is our evidence of a chemical change. The last step here is we do a mass balance with coefficients in front. All right, so coefficients in front. Now, you don't always need them, right? But sometimes you do. When I look at this one, I think we kind of got a little lucky. I got one zinc and one zinc on both sides, one sulfate group, one sulfate group, one barium, one barium, two chlorides, two chlorides. That's gonna happen when either your cations have the same charge or your anions have the same charge. When one of those are the same, then it will be a very simple, easy equation to balance at the end. Like there won't be any necessary coefficients. All right, so we've got our balanced equation. The zinc sulfate solution reacting with barium chloride solution forms barium sulfate precipitate. That's the chemical change we would see. And the zinc chloride just stays dissolved in solution. All right, so that's our balanced molecular equation. I'm going to rewrite it just so we can see it without all the notes on it. All right, so balanced molecular. So we've got our ZnSO4 aqueous plus BaCl2 aqueous. And we predicted ZnCl2 aqueous and BaSO4 solid. All right, some textbooks, um, they'll actually, with the precipitate, they'll show you like an arrow down just to kind of emphasize that that's the precipitate. I've never used that, but I have seen it. So if you look around on the internet and you see it, um, that's what that means. It's just like, it, it's almost the way I thought of it when I first saw it is the ions coming together and they usually will fall out of solution, right? They'll, they're more dense, so they sink. Um, but anyway, if you see that, that's what that is. All right, total ionic, all right? Also called the full ionic, all right? I've seen both, right? Or complete ionic, anyway. Here's, here's where it gets a little fun. This is my least favorite of the three because it's just, all, to me, this is where I was like, this seems redundant. <laughs> um, so what we're gonna do here is, rather than focusing on the compounds, we're gonna focus on the ions. So as a student, I was like, man, this really seems like unnecessary. But as a teacher, I'm like, okay, I see it. This is really more accurate. Um, it just is a lot of writing, all right? So when you have the ionic equation, Here's what you want to do. Anything that's aqueous, we want to break up into ions. And just remember, ions have to have charges. We talked about that earlier, right? There's a very big difference between sodium no charge and sodium plus one. Sodium no charge is so reactive, you have to store it under oil or else it will just start to basically produce a ton of hydrogen gas, which lights on fire. So it's a very interesting experiment. If you have sodium ion, that's obviously you know, nice and stable. It just sort of hangs out either in a solid crystal form or you dissolve it in water, no big deal. So big difference between sodium no charge and sodium plus one. So if it's an ion, it's gotta have a charge. These are all ionic compounds. So when we go to this step, just make sure your ion, all of your ions have charges on it. Anything aqueous. Um, the second thing is, this is where things start to get a little tricky, is charge balance subscripts move to the front. All right, I'm gonna squeeze that in. Yeah, okay. So, so charge balance subscripts move to the front. Okay, so this was equation number one, right? The balanced molecular. This is equation number two, the total ionic. All right, so remember there's three ways we can write the same equation or the same reaction. This is way number two. So we've already identified the ions, zinc and sulfate, that's still true. We're gonna now just show them separate with a plus sign. All right, that's how we show that they are now dissociated. They're two separate things. Remember the polyatomic ion subscript is locked in place. You can't move that. That's got to stay right where it is because that's sulfate. Here's the redundancy. It's, it's aqueous, so we have to make it marked aqueous. And I remember thinking, but if it's charged, it's automatically aqueous. We know that. Why are we writing that? But anyway, just ignore that. You just got to write it. All right, and then barium chloride. Barium plus two 
right, aqueous. And then here's where that charge balance subscript moves to the front. We were talking about how chloride, that subscript of two is just balancing the charge on the barium. This is not a polyatomic ion. So that two moves to the front of the chlorine. So I have two chloride minus one ions, right? So I just kind of want to highlight this. Actually, I don't know if the purple is going to show up. Let me do the red. That two subscript of charge balance two, right, moves to the front of the chloride, right? So uh, I've got zinc separate from sulfate, and I've got barium separate from the two chlorides. So basically, when barium chloride dissolves, the barium goes one way, and then the two chlorides go a different way. So you actually get three ions for barium chloride. One barium, two chlorides. So three total ions there. All right on the product side, the zinc chloride, again, it's aqueous. So that means that those ions are still dissolved. So they haven't changed from the reactant side. So it's still gonna be zinc plus two and the two chloride minus one. Right, because the ions don't change in double displacement, they only form precipitates. That precipitate is the barium sulfate. So the solid stays together, right? We only break up the aqueous substances, not the solid, right? The solid we don't touch. We don't change it. We don't move any subscripts, nothing. All right, so solid stays the same. We don't even, we don't even have to think about it. We just rewrite it. That's it. So this equation here, the total ionic, again, my least favorite of the three because it's a lot of writing, but it really is the most accurate. I had a solution that had zinc ions dissociated from sulfate ions. They were two separate things. They're floating around in solution. In my second solution, I've got barium ions and chloride ions, again, separate, floating around in solution. When I mix those two solutions together, the zinc and the chloride are still hanging out dissolved, dissociated, moving around in solution, don't see them. But the barium and the sulfate came together and formed that precipitate. That's the chemical change, right? And so we looked at this when we did physical and chemical properties in the lab. And one of the things that I mentioned to my lab students was, if anything looks exactly the same on both sides of the arrow, that means it didn't change. So it's only when something looks new, right? We have new bonds being formed. That's the chemical change. So we can see this, right? The barium and the sulfate, they start out separate and now they've come together to form a solid. That's the chemical change. And that's what we wanna write for the net ionic equation. So of the three, I have to admit, net ionic is, has always been my favorite. Professor, uh, yeah, go ahead. quick, how have we been determining that some sort of a compound has been solid or not? Is oh. it just because it's just generally that's what it is in terms of that combination? Yeah, so that comes from the solubility rules. Because so okay. like that, like there's no way for you to guess because some of them are really weird. Um, like you learn when we get towards the end of the semester, you'll learn a solubility kind of trends with whether or not the ion is large or small or whether it's a higher positive, like plus three versus plus one. And then you still see compounds that don't follow the trends at all. So you'd have to have the solubility rules to tell you which one the solid should be. So then it, just for reference, an insoluble rule on there, if anything pertains to the insoluble rules, then it is classified as a solid. Perfect, yes. Okay. And I put that in the key up at the top. I should have pointed that out, that if it's, if it's marked as soluble, that means we put aqueous. If, it's, if this solubility rule says insoluble, that means it's a solid. A lot of students get that backwards because you want to think S for soluble, but it's the opposite. <laughs> it's insoluble means that you've got a solid. Um, so that'll be up there in the key if you need it. If you like forget it on the test, that'll be up there. But you're absolutely right. If it says soluble, that means it dissolves. It's aqueous. Those are ions. If it says insoluble, that means it's the solid. All right. And yeah, you have to have the solubility rules to do it. All right, so the last part, the last three, or the last of the three, the net ionic equation. To me, I like this one the best because it's the simplest. And I always think if we can keep it simple, why not, right? So if we're talking about a chemical change, what we've talked about was the formation of that precipitate is what you would see. If you went into lab and you did this experiment, the formation of the barium sulfate is what you would witness in that test tube. You'd see that white precipitate form. So the net ionic says, okay, then let's just write that. What, are, what ions did we need to make that precipitate? And that's it. So the way I always looked at it was 
that I, I looked at it and said, okay, this is my chemical change, the formation of barium sulfate. What two things do I need to form that? Well, I need the barium and I need the sulfate, right? So I'm gonna take those two ions, keep those as my reactants, and then my barium sulfate is my product. There's my net ionic equation. What a lot of students prefer to do though, and this works just as well, is they look at the total ionic equation, almost like a math equation. And they say, okay, just like we learned in math, if you have like terms on both sides of the equal sign, they cancel out, right? So if I think of my arrow as an equal sign, and I, and I look at this and I say, well, I came into this math equation with a zinc ion, and on the other side, I've got a zinc ion. So I can tell here, I didn't use zinc, right? Zinc was never used. So zinc is what's called a spectator ion. It means, I mean, I, I love who named that, right? A I guess zinc is in solution watching the precipitate form, I don't know. And then the other thing here is the chloride, right? We came into this reaction with two chloride ions. And when we left, we still had two chloride ions. There's no change, right? That's just nothing, <laughs> nothing happened. So the two chlorides could also subtract out and go away. We could subtract two chlorides from both sides. We could subtract a zinc from both sides. But the barium and the sulfate, there's the change. So when you do the net ionic equation, we remove those spectator ions. And I'm just going to keep that pen so you can reference the color. The spectator ions are the zinc and the two chlorides. Right? They did not form a solid, so they were not important to this reaction. There was no chemical change by them. So instead, what I have is the sulfate polyatomic ion in solution, aqueous, combining with the barium plus two cation to make the BaSO4 solid. So again, the solid stays, right? Totally the same. We haven't touched it. So if you, that's one thing to kind of remember here. When we write the, the balanced molecular equation, the total ionic equation, and the net ionic equation, nothing changes for the solid. It stays the same all the way through. We don't touch it. The only thing that changes are the aqueous substances. In the molecular equation, because we're looking at molecules, right, compounds, everything is balanced as a compound. There's no ion charges to report because the charges are balanced out, right? Zinc is balanced by sulfate, barium balanced by chloride. When we start now focusing on the ionic equations, now we wanna start looking at the ions. So anything aqueous dissolves in water. When it does that, it turns into the ions, right? Because the ions dissociate. So this is where we have to have all of our charges in place. So we have our zinc ions, sulfate, barium, chloride, right? We've got all of our ions present and accounted for. We still show that same precipitate forming on the product side. Total ionic means everything's there, total. Net says, well, okay, that's great. But net means just show me the important part, which is the formation of BASO4. That was the chemical change. Now, some of the questions that are going to show up on the quiz are going to ask you for the sum of the coefficients. So this is one way to do it kind of in a multiple choice format, because otherwise, how do you do this multiple choice? Where... If you've got the correct equation, your sum of the coefficients will be the same as mine. So if you were going to do the sum of the coefficients for the total ionic equation, the coefficients, again, are the numbers in front. Don't forget, though, if there's no number in front, there's a one. So there'd be one zinc, one sulfate. So already we're up to two. One barium makes three. Two chlorides makes five, right? One zinc on the product side would make six, plus two chlorides makes eight, plus that precipitate makes nine. So you add up all of the coefficients. So one plus one plus one plus two is five on the reactant side, plus one plus two plus one, another four on the product side. So five plus four, we would have a sum of nine for the total ionic equation. For the net ionic equation, the sum of the coefficients, in this case, it's just one, one, and one. So we would just have three. One sulfate, one barium, and one barium sulfate. So one plus one plus one is three. Now, a question came up. Let's hypothetically say 
Uh, and I'm going to use a pencil because this is going to look weird. Let's say that after doing all of our equation writing, we ended up with two sulfates and two bariums and two barium sulfates. So when we go to write our net ionic equation, we would have a two and a two and a two. Sometimes that happens. Question was, should I reduce that? Um, and instead of making it two to two to two, make it one to one to one. I was always taught, yes, if you can simplify the equation, you simplify it. So instead of two to two to one, two, you would simplify it to one, one, and one. Um, I will accept either one though, because honestly, they're both technically correct. Um, I just was always taught by my professors, however many you know, decades ago, <laughs> that you simplify when you can, but you don't have to. You can leave it as two to two to two or one to one to one. All right, but that doesn't apply here anyway. If it comes up later, I'll, I'll point it out again. So three ways of expressing the exact same reaction. Again, I, I did, if you're thinking that seems redundant, I agree, it kind of is. All right, now, double displacement reactions, I think in terms of intro chem and the equation types that we cover, double displacement always seemed to cause the most amount of problems. And I, I totally understand why. You have to know your ionic charges really well. You have to know your polyatomic ions really well. Um, the solubility rules will be given, so just make sure you're, you're comfortable with reading those and, and determining what's soluble and insoluble. But then when you go to do the total and net ionic equations, that just takes some practice. And so you'll notice in the chapter five folder, I've got quite a few videos on double displacement reactions. So I do quite a bit of examples. Um, there's also worksheets. In fact, the, the double displacement worksheet is pretty robust. It'll, it'll keep you very busy if you want to be busy. Um, there's a lot of examples there. And, and I have to say, I, you know, I think I've mentioned this, because I'm not a giant fan of the total ionic equation, um, there, you'll see this at the end, I just crossed out the instructions altogether and was like, you know what, I've had enough of total ionic equations, let's not do those anymore. So this is the ionic equations worksheet, and the answer key is posted separate, so you can try it on your own first and then uh, look at your work. And I've got another example for you to look at before you get started if you want. And so for a lot of these, I do all three like I'm supposed to. I was being very good. And then I got to number four. And I, I think I did this during the Zoom session. I just did balanced, molecular, and net because I was like, I don't, I don't even want to do it. And then for number five, I just did balanced, molecular. So I kind of got a little lazy, I have to admit. Um, and you'll see that with this one also balanced and net. I didn't do the total. And then when I got to the very end, you'll, you'll see this in it. Um, I just crossed it out altogether. I was like, you know what? Let's just break the net. Um, but total ionic, definitely practice a couple of those. Make sure that you got it. Um, but I, I, I will say they're not, they're not my favorite. But net ionic I like because it's, it's just short and sweet. And balanced molecular I like because, you know, it says everything it needs to say. All right. So I'm going to pause here for a quick break. Um, I've got on my cat on my clock 1218. So let's come back at like 1225 and finish out the chapter. So seven minutes today. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. And if anybody has a question they want to ask me during the break, you're not on the recording, right? Okay, so for solution stoichiometry. So this goes back to where we started with the beginning of the Zoom session. So stoichiometry to me is the flip book. Right, so we're flipping through. We know that the center point of every stoichiometric calculation we ever do is that mole ratio, right? That's what stoichiometry is, is that we're comparing two different substances in a chemical equation. And the only way for us to do that, do that is through the mole to mole ratio. So that is always your center point. So where we began when we started the flip book, right, is we were learning, okay, if we have mass and we wanna convert that to moles, we use molar mass from the periodic table. And like I had mentioned in this section, we also always learn Avogadro's because we want to understand what the mole represents. But right when we go in the lab, we don't have machines that measure how many molecules we have, right? They measure what mass we have, we, we can have that, and we have equipment that'll measure the volume. So we won't really use Avogadro's that much more moving forward. I can't say it won't ever come up again, but it's not as critical as it was on the first test. So volume of volume of A, substance A, going to moles, what we're going to see as we get into the next chapter with gas laws is it's going to depend. You have to be careful with volume because sometimes it could be the volume of a gas and sometimes it could be the volume of a solution. And those are two very different things. 
What we're learning in this chapter is molarity, the capital M, which is the bridge between volume and moles, but only for a solution. Molarity does not apply to a gas, right, that ever. So what we want to make sure and kind of pay close attention to is that when we're looking at the volume of something and converting it to moles, we use molarity if it's a solution, right, something marked AQ in the equation. So if I look at the other side of this, if I figure out moles of B and I want to go to mass of B, again, molar mass is going to be my flip book choice, right? I'm going to flip to molar mass. But if I want to go to volume of B and B happens to be an aqueous solution, then I'm going to use that molarity of B to get me there. So solution stoichiometry is going to bring in the molarity that we started with at the top of the Zoom session, right? That's going to be our bridge to convert between mass, sorry, volume and moles. Everything starts with M. So I was going to say moles and mass came out. So sorry, between volume and moles, we got to do molarity. So here's an example. We've got a double displacement reaction. This is silver nitrate ionic compound in solution and sodium chromate, again, dissolved in solution. And we predicted sodium goes with nitrate. That's on the product side. Aqueous because sodium, like we saw, always soluble. And the silver goes with the chromate. And that's the solid because if I look at my solubility rules, right, chromates are frequently insoluble. So again, if it's sodium chromate, it's soluble because that rule is dominant. Sodium is soluble no matter what you put it with. But chromate, right? Chromate is typically insoluble if it's not with a group one metal. So that's why this is going to be our solid. So neither here or there, we got our balanced double displacement reaction, just reviewing what we talked about before the break. Now the question says, now we're going to do the stoichiometry. Well, let me keep the flow chart in there. How many milliliters of the silver nitrate? So I'm going to put question mark volume. And we have a concentration of 0 0.100 molar. And again, if you want to right now, if you want to say, wait a minute, M is moles per liter, that works, right? And we are reacting it with 750.0 milliliters of sodium chromate and the concentration 0 0.0250 mole per liter. So one thing I remember doing on my tests um, is I always used my chemical equation to kind of organize my thoughts. And you've probably noticed me doing that in the previous Zoom sessions. So what I mean by that is I've got this chemical equation written out. For the silver nitrate, it wanted to know the volume. So underneath it, I put question mark volume. And it gave me, because it's a, a solution, we talked about molarity. We need that conversion factor. But it's not like molar mass where you go get it from the periodic table. It has to be given to you in the problem. So that's what these are given to us, the molarities, right? Those are our conversion factors. And because I recognize that molarity is a conversion factor, I put it in parentheses here. You notice me that I did that to remind myself later that goes in the parentheses when I do my setup, right? So I just always remember that's my conversion factor. Now I've got 750 milliliters of sodium chromate. And again, the molarity is given to me because that's my conversion factor. So when I do stoichiometry, personally, I think you always want to start with the single unit measurement, which is mass or volume. So I'm going to start with a volume because this is a solution, right? We don't have mass, we have volume. So the 750 milliliters is going to be what I start with. So that tells me that the sodium chromate is my A and the silver nitrate is my B, right? Where am I starting? Where am I going? So I'm going to now slide this up. I start with my volume. I have 750 milliliters of sodium chromate. Now, when I use molarity, the only thing I recognize is that molarity is moles per liter, and this isn't. This is in milliliters. So just real quick, a thousand milliliters is equal to a liter. Or if you want to put one milliliter is 10 to the negative three liters, doesn't matter, right? But we had to make sure and get that unit conversion first. Now we can bring in the molarity. All right, so that's one thing you have to make sure of with molarity is that you've got to be in, whoops, liters. That's supposed to be an N. Uh, okay, I'll just say, make sure you're in liters. <laughs> Okay, molarity, there's my molarity. So 0 0.0250 moles of sodium chromate per liter. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and write my substance up here because otherwise I will, I will run out of room if I put it out to the side. All right, so I've got my milliliters converted to liters. 
and I just converted leaders to moles using my molarity, right? So molarity is our conversion factor that takes the place of molar mass when we have the volume of a solution rather than mass. Now that I have moles of A, I need to go to moles of B, right? So now I'm gonna get rid of moles of sodium chromate on the bottom. And once I have moles of A on the bottom, I can go to moles of B on top. So the silver nitrate goes on top, right? Like we learned, this is our mole ratio from the balanced equation. So on the bottom with sodium chromate, nothing in front, it's an implied one. And on top with silver nitrate, we've got a coefficient of two. So there's my mole to mole ratio. Now in the next conversion step, I need something that gets rid of moles of silver nitrate and goes to volume. And this one, it says milliliters. The only problem though is with molarity, it's moles per liter. So we're gonna need another step there to get liters into milliliters. So what I have here is a molarity that's 0 0.100 moles of silver nitrate. Now here's a choice. On top, I can put one liter, right? Cause that's what molarity is defined as, it's moles per liter. But instead of doing a second conversion step here, let me just show you in pencil where I would have one liter is a thousand milliliters, right? To get our unit into milliliters. If you want to, because a, a liter is equal to a liter, right? Those are equivalent. What I can substitute on top and save myself a step is one liter is equal to a thousand milliliters. So if there's 0.1 moles in a liter, that means there's 0.1 moles in a thousand milliliters. And then I don't have to do that additional setup back here. All right, and the same goes for up in the front over here. If I wanted to merge these two conversions into one, I could have had 0 0.0250 moles of sodium chromate is equal to a thousand milliliters because I know one liter is equal to a thousand milliliters. Anyway, your choice, I used to always consolidate, but you don't have to do it that way. So we canceled out sodium chromate moles, canceling out moles of silver nitrate, and we've got milliliters on top. That's what we're looking for. Now we have to talk about sig figs. Okay, normally we always went back to the beginning and our starting measurement and we looked at sig figs. 750.0, that has four significant figures. So we would then calculate everything on the calculator and round to four significant figures. Here's the rub with that. When we were in the last chapter, molar mass, those are constants from the periodic table. So they didn't limit the sig figs. Molarity, however, this, these are not constants. These are specific to this solution and they act like measurements. When I make a solution in lab, I can give you a very specific concentration if I took really specific measurements, or maybe I can only give you a molarity with two sig figs because I wasn't very careful when I measured it out. So you have to also check molarity for sig figs. So I'm gonna write a little note, make sure you check volume and molarity for least sig figs. Always, right, least always wins. So my starting volume has four sig figs. The molarity of the sodium chromate, remember the zeros in front are just placeholders. So one, two, three sig figs for the molarity of sodium chromate. And then the molarity of the silver nitrate, also only three sig figs. So when I get my answer here, I can only have three sig figs. So I'm going to take the 750, divide by 1,000, multiply by 0 0.025, multiply by 2, then multiply it by 1,000, and divide that by 0 0.1. And I get 375 milliliters. So I just want to type it in one more time because I always worry that I hit the wrong key because it's easy to do. All right, so 375 milliliters silver nitrate. All right, and so that also three significant figures. So that would be the volume of silver nitrate I would, I would use. I would react with the 750 milliliters of sodium chromate, all right? So solution stoichiometry looks pretty similar to the stoichiometry we did before, but the difference obviously is that we're using volumes now rather than mass, which means we use molarity rather than molar mass. So otherwise, I think it looks pretty similar. Okay, so there's solution stoichiometry. Now the next section talks about acid-base reactions. 
And so this will be a specific type of equation for us to learn. It is a subcategory of double displacement. This is, it, it, it's just more specifically acid base. So what we wanna remember um, from our nomenclature is acid starts with H, right? So we're still gonna look for that. Base for intro chem, chem one, um, we looked for hydroxide. And what an acid base reaction always makes is water, right? It's called a neutralization reaction. The hydrogen ions from the acid combine with the hydroxide ions from the base and it makes HOH, but we move that second H to the front and we call it H2O, right? But don't, do not, if you prefer to write this as HOH, don't hesitate because that is the structural formula. Um, the water molecule has an oxygen center, hydrogen on either side. So that is the correct structural formula for water. We always write it as H2O, but if it makes more sense to write it as HOH, then please do so. But that is our acid-base reaction. Now, the, the thing that makes this double displacement is you have an ion in solution. So the hydrogen will be aqueous, the hydroxide will be aqueous. Those will both be present in water. And then the water that we make, you don't note that as aqueous because water doesn't dissolve in water. Water is water. So it'll be a liquid. And we're not doing combustion like we saw water is a gas. This will just be pure liquid, L. Um, so that is basically, if we were thinking about the three types of equations that we went over, balanced, molecular, total ionic, net ionic, for almost all acid-base reactions, this is your net ionic equation. <laughs> so um, that's a little foreshadowing. Now, acid-base reactions are a little tricky because when you do them in lab, you don't necessarily notice a chemical change. You've got a colorless solution and a colorless solution, and you make a colorless solution. But if the concentration of acid and base are both strong enough, you're going to feel some heat. There's, these are going to be exothermic reactions. You'll feel the test tube get hot. Um, it also depends on how strong the acid and base are. So like we talked about, some acids are weak acids, some are strong. What I have here is these are your six strong acids. I don't think you need to memorize this. Um, it's just kind of general knowledge, I guess, maybe, but don't memorize it. Um, so of the halogens, Hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, those are all strong. Hydrofluoric, like I talked about, is not. So weak electrolyte versus strong electrolytes. And then when it comes to the polyatomic ions, the more what are called terminal oxygens, um, the stronger the acid it will be. So like sulfate is a stronger acid, sulfuric acid, than the sulfite, sulfurous acid. So H2SO4 is stronger than H2SO3. Um, HNO3 is stronger than HNO2. HClO4 is stronger than HClO3, right? But that's just general knowledge. That's not anything. Will a lot of emphasis be placed on knowing which acids are strong or weak? No, no, not till chem two. When you start looking at those equilibrium constants, then you'll start looking at, oh, this is a strong acid, this is a weak acid, but not till then. All right, so just general, um, don't need to memorize that one. So the non-binary acids, like I meant, that are like I was talking about the more terminals, but again, don't worry about that either. So this is our H from the acid, hydroxide from the base to make water. So that's our general equation. And it, it does come under the category of, of double displacement because the H is the cation, the A is the anion, B is the cation, OH is the anion. And so you put the H with the OH and that salt, whatever that would be, that would be that B with A, right? So you can, you can balance this just like you did double displacement. Um, but I think there's a shortcut that I always like. This is the way I always teach it with a face to face, well, not face to face, but intro chem and chem one, is you want the numbers of the hydrogen and the acid to equal the number of hydroxides in the base to equal the number of waters that are made. Basically what happens here is for every one hydrogen, you need one hydroxide to make one water. So it would make sense that if you have two hydrogens, you need two hydroxides to make two waters. They always have to be equal in count. So I find that that's a nice way of doing these uh, and I'll show you with the first example. So we've got calcium hydroxide. Okay, so calcium group two alkaline earth metal plus two charge hydroxide polyatomic minus one. So this has to be CaOH2. Neutralizes just means that this is an acid-base reaction. Hydrochloric means binary. So H with Cl. 
All right, and the this is going to be in solution. Calcium hydroxide is not overly soluble. It's kind of in the middle, uh, but we won't worry about that right now. We'll put it as aqueous. All right, so if I do it this way here, that what I think of is sort of a simple way. Um, and let me just sort of note here, emphasize for all other equations, you have to balance your, or you have to predict your products first, and then you balance. Only with acid base can you balance first and then do your products. And the reason why is this right here. For every one hydrogen, I need one hydroxide to make one water. Those have to be in balance. So because I have two hydroxides, in the calcium hydroxide, the very first thing I'm gonna do is look at the hydrogen and the acid. So because I've got two hydroxides from the base, I have to have two hydrogens from the acid. So I put a two in front of HCl and I have to make two waters. So that two is gonna go right in front of the water. And if you wanna write HOH, you can do that. Or if you wanna write H2O, you can do that, right? And that is up to you. So the reason why I kind of like writing it as HOH is because sometimes that H and the hydroxide, students forget about it when they come over to the product side and they start balancing. Because when they look at the water as H2O, they're like, oh, okay, I got two hydrogens here. And so I look at this hydrogen here to balance. So because there's two, I need two, but there's another two hydrogens over here in the hydroxide and that's easy to forget. If I look at it this way, two hydroxides, two hydrogens, two waters, right? Then I know that I've taken care of this H and the OH, right? Those two things have come together to make the waters, right? So that's now done. What I have left is the calcium and the chloride. And what's nice about this is if the H and the OH are balanced, by default, whatever's left, that BA, is automatically balanced. So I had one calcium and two chlorides. And what makes sense is when this compound comes together, I need one calcium and two chlorides. It will always work, it's wonderful. Now the ionic compound here, typically that's gonna be aqueous, but your solubility rules would tell you for sure. All right, um, yes, it is possible that you make a precipitate, but typically I, it's an aqueous, um, but let's just check it. Salts containing chloride are generally soluble. The exceptions, right? The calcium is not one of them. So that one would be aqueous. So we've got our balanced equation. One calcium, one calcium. The two hydroxides and the two hydrogens made two waters. And then the two chlorides and the two chlorides. So we've got a balanced equation. Now, just like we did for double displacement, right? We can do the total ionic and the net ionic. So breaking everything up, calcium plus two, right? That two subscript outside the parentheses is a charge balance subscript, so it moves to the front. So it would be two hydroxides and we react it with two hydrogens and two chlorides, All right? So we've got the calcium, the two hydroxides, the two hydrogens and the two chlorides, all separate, they're all ions, they all have charges. On the product side, when we were doing double displacement reactions, we said the solid stays together, all right? In this case, the liquid stays the same, all right? It acts like a precipitate in that when the ions come together, they come together and stay together. So we wanna leave this as H2O or HOH, you write it however you want, but the calcium, would still be dissolved and the chloride would still be dissolved because that's aqueous, right? Anything aqueous breaks up. So the liquid stays the same. So we that looks familiar, right? We got all of our ions on the reactant side, our liquid product, and then our ions, the spectator ions over here. In terms of the net ionic equation, right? If I look at this, the calcium is a spectator, it would go away. The two chlorides are also spectators. So we're gonna remove those. We remove the calcium and the two chloride. And then what shows us that we had a chemical change is that we took the two hydroxides, reacted it with the two hydrogens to make two waters, All right? Now, what 
came up earlier was, should I reduce that? And again, I was taught, yes, instead of it being two to two to two, you simplify it to one to one to one. But both are technically correct. All right, so I would write this as hydroxide in solution, hydrogen in solution, coming together to make water, which is a liquid. All right, so that would be my net ionic equation for this acid-base reaction and for most acid-base reactions, right? Okay, so titration. Titration is the lab that we're doing this week. We actually are doing it twice. We're standardizing sodium hydroxide, which just means we're determining the molarity of that. And then for the second part of the lab, we use that sodium hydroxide to do a reaction with an antacid tablet. Um, so kind of fun, I don't know, but titration is a great experiment. Make sure you watch the videos. Um, I always love doing titration. Most students really like them too, because they're it's kind of like little magic tricks. You got the pH indicator and one drop can make it clear. The other drop makes it pink and you can go back and forth and students usually out like it, I always did. Um, but titration, it's, it's a way of determining the concentration of a solution. Um, so that's how a titration works. And so you, you have two solutions that you're reacting together. So just hypothetical, let's say it's calcium hydroxide and HCl. One of these you would know the concentration of and the other one you wouldn't. And you do this titration, um, you, you combine the two together in a very controlled system using burettes and your pH indicator tells you when you've reached what's called endpoint, where you have an equilibrium, an equal, of H and OH. When those two become equal, the indicator changes color. So because you've run out of acid or you've run out of base, whichever way you're doing it, the indicator changes color to tell you, hey, you just ran out of acid um, or base, like again, depending on which way you're doing it. So titration is really fun. I always like doing it. So make sure you watch the video for the lab class. But when we do calculations for titration, here's how it's gonna look. Um, it'll say, okay, we're taking this HBr solution we don't know the molarity of it. Okay, focus, there we go. And we're gonna take this standardized magnesium hydroxide because we know the concentration, we know the volume that we've used. We've reacted those two to endpoint and we wanna figure out that HBr solution, what was the molarity of that? So a couple of things here. The first thing I wanna point out is we've got two different substances. We've got HBr and MgOH2. So going back to something Oh, I just saw this come in in the chat. Sorry, Mike. Uh, yes. So a weak acid for now, go ahead and break them up. Um, so let me go back here. If back on here, if this had been HF, which is a weak acid, you'd still break it up into H and F, two separate ions. The, the whether or not it dissociates and to what extent really doesn't become important until chem two, when you start looking at equilibrium. So in my opinion, right now, we're not there yet. If it's an acid, whether weak or strong, I want you to break them up. If it's aqueous, break it up. We don't wanna worry about, well, is it only 30% broken up or is it a hunt? Yeah, don't worry about that. If it's aqueous, break it up. We're gonna leave it simple like that. Sorry, I just saw that question come in. Um, okay, so back to here. Going back to something we talked about before the break. This, this problem is, is, is a problem that is so, is so hard for me as a teacher because I always want to give credit when I can. And a lot of times with this question, I end up not being able to give any credit. And, I, and this is why. A student will look at this and they'll say, oh, I've got a volume. I got a volume and a molarity and I want to know molarity. That looks like I should use M1V1 equals M2V2, right? right? It looks perfect. You've got a V1, you don't know M1, and then you got a V2 and you got an M2. That looks perfect, right? But if you remember what we talked about, you can't use that here, all right? So you can't use it. Don't use it because what that formula fails to capture is the mole ratio. Remember, this is saying moles one equals moles two. And I don't know if the mole ratio of those two substances is one to one. If it's one-to-one, -one, you technically could use this formula, but you're gonna see this is not a one-to-one -one ratio. So don't use that formula, even though it looks like it would fit so beautifully, right? And again, the reason is, is because this formula does not take into account a mole ratio. 
So when I introduced the dilution formula, I said, here's how you know that it's, it's something you wanna use. You use it when there's only one substance. And we don't have that here. We've got two substances, right? So that's what I wanna point out. We have two substances in this equation. We've got the hydrobromic acid and the magnesium hydroxide. So that's why we can't use that formula here. Instead, what we need is we're first gonna to have to start with the balanced equation. If we're relating two substances together, the only way to do that is with the equation. So we gotta start there. So what is our chemical equation? We're taking HBr. We know it's a solution because we got a volume of it. And because it tells me it's a solution, that means we mark it as aqueous. And we're combining it with a magnesium hydroxide solution. So just like what we talked about with the previous example, I check, I've got two hydroxides in the base, but only one hydrogen in the acid. So I go ahead and multiply HBr by two. And that's gonna tell me that I make two waters, right? Cause they're always equal two, two, and two. And then the salt is the magnesium bromide. So magnesium goes first cause it's the positive. Bromine goes second because it's the negative. And when I check my solubility rules, halogens like bromide and chloride are generally soluble with just a couple of exceptions. Magnesium's not one of them. So I've got my balanced equation here and now I can do my stoichiometry. So I've got 25 milliliters of HBr, but I don't know what the molarity is. That's what I'm looking for. And I have 37.51 milliliters of magnesium hydroxide and concentration 0 0.01580 moles per liter. All right, so this is a little bit harder, I think, for a lot of students because what I had mentioned the last time we did solution stoichiometry is I said, hey, always start with a volume. And then you look at this and you say, well, wait, now there's two volumes. So now what do I, now what do I know? So here's what I want the kind of foreshadowing. If I started with the 25 mils of HBr, we know that because it's a volume of a solution, if I think about the flip book, the molarity is what's gonna take me to moles, but I don't know what the molarity is. So this is a dead end. Uh, the 25 mils, I have no way of taking the moles because I don't know what the molarity is. But the 37.51 milliliters of magnesium hydroxide, I can get that to moles because I've got the molarity. The other way you can simplify it is whatever you're being asked about, the question mark, that's always your B. And that means the other substance is your A. Right, so that might help also. So I know I'm gonna start with magnesium hydroxide and go to HBr. When I start with my magnesium hydroxide, I know I wanna start always with volume first, not molarity. So I'm gonna start with 37.51 milliliters of MgOH2. When I set up my conversion step, the molarity, right? That's our bridge to moles. It's 0.01. 580 moles per liter, but I recognize that my volume units aren't canceling out. So instead of one liter on the bottom, I'm gonna put a thousand milliliters. And I'm just gonna put my substance here on top to save some space. All right, so there's my molarity of magnesium hydroxide. Now I can do my mole to mole ratio. So getting rid of magnesium hydroxide on the bottom, going to HBr on top, all right, there's my one to two mole ratio from the balanced equation. And then the way I do this is I actually pause here. I stop here for a second because what I'm trying to solve for is the molarity of HBr. So what I need is the moles of HBr per liter of solution used. I've got the liters, I just have it in milliliters, but that's easy enough to change to liters. I need to understand the moles. So the way a titration works is you do this reaction until you get to endpoint. And at that endpoint, you know that you just neutralized your acid or you just neutralized your base. Again, either you just turned it uh, pink or you just turned it clear, depending on which way you're going. So what, I, what I'm doing in the math here is I'm saying, okay, I have this volume of magnesium hydroxide knowing that this is the molarity, I know this is how many moles of magnesium hydroxide were in my reaction. Because I know my mole to mole ratio, then that tells me how many moles of HBr were in this reaction. So if I stop here for just a second, all right, let me get the answer. I've got 
times 0 0.01580 divided by 1,000 times 2. I have 0 0.001185 moles of HBr. And if I want to find out the molarity, I know that that 0 0.001185 moles of HBr, that came from that 25 milliliter sample that I used that was given to me up at the top. Now, the only problem is molarity has to be moles per liter. So I need to change milliliters into liters just real quick, because at the end, I need to make sure I'm in moles per liter. So I'm gonna take my moles, divide it by 25, multiply by a thousand. When I check my sig figs, I've got four, four, and four. So I'm gonna keep four. So 0 0.04741 molarity HBR. And again, either capital M or mole per liter, depending on what your preference is. All right, so titration, a little bit harder. Now, just kind of to convince you that I, you know, this, this doesn't work. If I plugged in, uh, let's do M2.0158 times V2, 37.51, divide it by that V1 of 25. So for this problem, are we unable to use the M1 V1 equals M2 V2? Right. Yeah, you can't. Because what it doesn't capture is this step right here. Like if you think about it, this, this M2 V2, that's the same as there's my V2 and my M2. And then I'm just dividing it by my V1, right? To solve for M1, but it doesn't take into account this step right here. So that's, so, go ahead. You know, so in a way it's like the M1 V1, M2 V2, but you also do need to account for the ratio. Exactly. And I have some students that can see it and they'll, they'll in their head, they'll be like, okay, I see this, this is my V2, my M2, that's my V1. They'll get their answer and then they're like, oh, and now I have to multiply by two. The only problem is sometimes they go the wrong way. And instead of multiplying by two, they divide by two, like they just have the mole ratio backwards in their head. So maybe be a little bit careful with that, um, but that's the missing piece. But like it, that formula doesn't capture that step, but that otherwise it is the same math. It just doesn't have that piece in it. So that's why I say, you know what? If you got two different substances, that's what you look for. Just go ahead and do the stoichiometry. That's up to you though. All right, um, any other questions about titration? And if you feel like you want more examples on titration, there are videos and there's also the worksheet that's got some titration questions on it. So there's definitely more to do. There's also some in the homework problems as well. Um, so titration, because you're solving for molarity, to me, I treat it as a two-parter. And the first thing I do, let me kind of color code this. The first thing I do is I find my moles of the B, in this case, the HBr. And then the second step is to solve for the molarity. So that's kind of how I do, anytime I have to solve for molarity, I think of it as doing it in two parts. Get your moles of solute first, then divide it by your liters to get molarity. All right, now we talked about um, this chapter is all about reactions and solutions. So we talked about double displacement. We talked about acid base. There are a couple of reactions that will generate gas. And there's a few kind of things that you want to look for. So you'll see this in the homework. If you have carbonate or bicarbonate, when you mix that with acid, they love to produce CO2. They decompose. So this is your baking soda with vinegar, right? The volcano. Um, the sulfide with acid likes to produce H2S, and that one, you don't see it, you smell it. Um, and the other one that's like the carbonate is the sulfite, SO3, that does the same thing. Instead of CO2, it's SO2 gas. All right, and then the last one here that's kind of worth, worth mentioning is when you have ammonium hydroxide which is basically ammonia and water. So it just moves one of the hydrogens over to the hydroxide and the ammonium becomes ammonia. So those couple of examples sort of come up in the homework as being gas producers, right? That's the big thing. You'll see that they produce gas. Um, so the, those are just a couple of like special circumstances to look at. Now the last section here, I definitely want to get started because we only have a half hour left and this, this can take a little bit. These are called redox reactions, oxidation reduction. So redox, right, that stands for reduction oxidation. 
Um, reduction occurs when you gain electrons. Oxidation occurs when you release electrons. So a, a redox reaction, what's different here is really balancing it is balancing the electron exchange. And we really don't do that until chem two, where we start looking at oxidation states and how many electrons were lost or gained and balancing. We keep it a little bit simpler here, but we are gonna look at what is being oxidized and what is being reduced just to kind of introduce the topic. All right, so here's, here's what I um, will sort of start out with. The first thing we have to look at are what are called oxidation states and not to be confused with a charge but sometimes they can be the same thing. Ha, ah, that sounds confusing. So if I have something like sodium chloride, we recognize that sodium is plus one and chloride is minus one. Those are charges, right? Sodium is a plus one charge. Chloride is a plus, or sorry, minus one charge. Those are also the oxidation state. So in that case, the oxidation state and the charge are the same thing. Where it's not a charge, but rather an oxidation state, is when you have a covalent compound. So like if I have carbon dioxide, non-metal and non-metal, we learned when we did nomenclature, that's a covalent compound. There are no ions present because it's not metal and non-metal, right? So there's no ionic charges here. This is where you then look at what are called oxidation states rather than charges, they're called oxidation states, but it's the same general idea. However, what's confusing here is if I'm trying to look at the charges of CO2, if they're not ions, then how do I know what charge to use, right? So there's some rules here. Rule number one, the oxidation state of a monoatomic, mono so singular atom, such as iron or oxygen, the charge is always zero. So this is what I was talking about earlier. If I have sodium by itself and there's nothing balancing it because it's by itself. If there's no charge written up top, then it's, it's automatically a zero. This would be sodium solid, elemental form. If it's sodium plus one ion, right, then the charge would have to be there because it's not being balanced by something, right? It's just sitting there by itself. And these are aqueous, right? So there's the, this is all very different, right? So sodium, no charge. So when it's talking about the oxidation state of something monoatomic, a, a singular atom, just one element by itself, um, the diatomics also qualify here. So like H2, the charge is zero, or Cl2, the charge is zero, or oxygen, the charge is zero. Now that's when they're by themselves. If I have O2 in a compound, then the charge isn't zero anymore. All right, so let's go further. Rule number two, oxidation states of all the atoms in a molecule must equal zero. So what I mean by that is the sodium and the chloride together have to go to zero. Plus one, minus one goes to zero. Water, two hydrogens, plus one, plus one, negative two goes to zero. If it's a polyatomic ion, then all of the charges have to equal the polyatomic ion. So we're gonna do examples of this here in a minute. The hard part is the hierarchy, right? So if I'm gonna assign oxidation states in CO2, do I do the oxygen first or do I do the carbon first? And what I always kind of pictured in my mind is when I look at my periodic table, this is gonna sound weird, you do perimeter first and then go in. So in other words, in terms of dominance, right? And this is not always true, but a lot of times it is. Noble gases, we, those don't typically come up so we can skip that, but typically we'll go negative one, negative two, negative three, but we go out, we go out to end. So if I'm looking at the, the carbon dioxide, I'm gonna do the oxygen first and then the carbon. And same over here, like do the perimeter first. We know these are plus one and plus two, these we don't know. All right, now when I look at this first one here, Al2O3, right? This one, metal, non-metal, this one's pretty simple because it matches what we expect. So in this case, because it's an ionic compound, the charge is also the same as the oxidation state, All right? And what we have here is aluminum is carrying a plus three charge like we expect, and oxygen is a negative two, and that's how we get Al2O3. So ionic compounds are, are they sort of follow the rules, right? Because that's, we use ionic charges to make the compound formula, 
and the ionic charge is the same as the oxidation state. So those are typically easy. Now, P4, that's one of those monoatomic, right? This is just phosphorus by itself. It has a subscript of four, but that doesn't change the fact that the phosphorus, each phosphorus is in a zero, right? It has no charge. And I think that makes sense. If you think about it, if I put four phosphorus together in a molecule, it wouldn't make sense for one phosphorus to be a positive three and the other one to be a negative three. You know what I mean? They all have the same charge because they're all phosphorus. And if there's no charge overall, then that means each one has to be a zero, right? So that any, any element that's by itself, no charge indicated, the charge is automatically zero. So we talked about H2, zero, right? Oxygen, zero. All the hoff Frankel, the diatomics. Now here's where it'll get more interesting. We've got carbon, hydrogen, and fluoride. So if I think about the periodic table, I do perimeter, right? So I start with what I know. I know fluoride minus one. And then also on the perimeter, the hydrogen I know is a plus one. It's the carbon that I don't know, right? So always go perimeter of the table inward. So what I'm looking at here is, I'm gonna say that the carbon is X, right? I don't know the charge. I'm gonna look at it like X in algebra. So what I've got is X for carbon, hydrogen is a one, right? But there's three of them. So I have to multiply that plus one by three because there's three hydrogens there. And then I know the fluoride is a minus one. Whoops. And I put a seven. Uh, that's a one. All right. Now, overall, it's a compound. So the charge is zero. So it's not a polyatomic ice. Let me move this fluoride out of the way. So the carbon is my X. The hydrogen is a plus one, there's three of those, and fluoride is minus one, right? So those are the charges I know. So I know that hydrogen is plus one, fluoride's minus one. Those are, those are the knowns. The carbon though, that's the one I don't know, right? So again, looking at perimeter, make one your unknown, All right? So really quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Why are we multiplying the three by one? Because there's three hydrogens. And so- Oh, each, that's right, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's okay. Each one brings in plus one. So it's almost like X plus one, plus one, plus one, minus one. And all of that together, because it's a compound, it, this all goes to zero. So I need to figure out what X is. So again, kind of in, thinking in terms of the periodic table, we go out to in. So I know fluoride minus one, hydrogen plus one. So I start with that and then I move in. So carbon is the one I, I don't know. So leave one as your unknown. So carbon is the unknown. So I've got X for carbon, hydrogen plus one, there's three of them and fluoride minus one. So when I look at this algebra formula, basically I have X plus three minus one equals zero. So if I continue that X plus two equals zero, so X must be negative two. So negative two for carbon, negative one for fluoride, total negative three, and positive three for the three hydrogens. So the oxidation state on carbon is a negative two. Now, not a charge, because again, this is not an ionic compound. So it's not like the aluminum and oxygen up above where those charges those, those are the ionic charges and their, the oxidation state. They're the same thing because it's ionic. This is a covalent compound. And we learned if it's covalent, there's no ions, right? So that's why we don't use the term ion. It's, it's an oxidation state instead, but it's kind of the same idea, right? We're just balancing charges. So in this CH3F, what we just identified is carbon is negative two, hydrogen plus one, and fluoride minus one. Those are the oxidation states there. All right, three hydrogens is why it balances out to zero. Now, the last one here, we've got hydrogen arsenate and it has a total negative two charge. So again, in terms of perimeter, the hydrogen, let's, let's do that. Let's start with what we know, all right? The knowns, hydrogen will be plus one and oxygen will be a negative two, right? Because those are on the perimeter. The unknown is going to be the arsenic. So that's the one we want to figure out. So when I go into this, kind of leaving arsenic as my X, hydrogen is a plus one. Arsenic is an X. We don't know what that is. Oxygen is negative two, but there's 
four of them okay, in the in the formula. It's got a subscript of four. So we have to multiply negative two times four. And then overall, the polyatomic ion carries a charge of negative two. So that negative two is what I want to make all of that equal to, right? Rather than zero like we had up here because this was a compound, the CH3F. So when I go through this, I've got one plus X minus eight equals negative two. So if I carry this over, X minus seven equals negative two. So if I add seven to both sides, X equals positive five. All right, so now I know that the oxidation state on the arsenic is a positive five. All right, so that would be my oxidation state for the arsenic in the HISO4 negative two. So we've got our oxidation states. Now in Chem 2, you'll use those oxidation states to actually track electron transfer and they can get really complicated, but we, we save that for, for Chem 2. Now what we're going to do is basically look at redox reactions as it pertains to what are called single displacement reactions, which keeps it much simpler. We won't have any real complicated oxidation states in single displacement reactions. But te technically what you do if it's redox is you look at all of those oxidation states, you look at what's been oxidized, what's been reduced, and you balance out your electrons, right? But we won't have to worry about this part until chem two. So what we can do though, for now, is just focus on what are called single displacement reactions. So this is our generic formula. We have a single, that's how I rec it's easy to recognize. We got a single element A reacting with some compound BC. And if a reaction occurs, A, will, a and B will switch places, right? So there's a couple of things to think about here. First thing is, you can do single displacement reaction with metals, or you can do them with halogens. And when we do them in lab, we're going to do them with halogens. If it's a metal, A is going to be a metal. It'll be a solid and it'll have no charge, right? It'll be a neutral, like uh, taking copper metal or iron metal, right? And we put that metal into a compound that is dissolved in water an ionic compound dissolved in water. So your B is another metal cation or possibly a hydrogen, it could be acid. And what's interesting here is this reaction doesn't always occur. You know, we, we learned combustion always makes CO2 and H2O gas. Acid base always makes water. Double displacement always makes a precipitate. Single displacement, you actually have the option of saying nothing happens. Right, and so we're gonna need an activity series of metals to decide. So one possibility is no reaction, right? No reaction occurs if A is less active than B, but a reaction will occur if A is more active than B, All right? So when I wanna decide if a reaction occurs or not, so I'm gonna say no goes that way. I'm gonna need on that same paper that the solubility rules are at the top. Here's our activity series of metals. And I think if you saw that series, you could probably make sense of it. Um, over on the right, we've got platinum, gold, silver, copper, right? These are metals that we understand are highly unreactive, right? We wear them as jewelry, we mine for them in the earth, right? They come out in their elemental form. Whereas over on the left, potassium, calcium, sodium, magnesium, these are highly reactive metals. They're mostly in salt water, right? Most of our sodium on the earth is in salt water, it's ions. So over on the left, we have highly reactive elements that prefer to be ions. And over on the right, we prefer to have the atoms. They prefer to be neutral rather than positive charge. Um, so this is gonna tell us the activity series. So for example, if I put magnesium metal into acid, it's gonna form a reaction. But if I put copper metal into acid, nothing will happen, All right? So that's what we're gonna look at with these. Um, so let me start with an example. I think that's the easiest. Let's do aluminum in acid. So we've got that neutral aluminum, right? That's our A, there's no charge. Right, so your, your neutral metal or the metal that starts out alone is always neutral, no charge. 
And then I've got my cation here, which is H plus. So what I'm comparing on my activity series is the aluminum and the hydrogen. Chlorine is just along for the ride. So I've got my aluminum and I've got hydrogen. When I look at my activity series, what I recognize is aluminum would rather be the ion and hydrogen would prefer to be the atom, the neutral. And that's not how this is. I've got aluminum as the neutral and hydrogen as the ion. So they should switch. So the aluminum, if there's a reaction, the neutral becomes the cation and the cation becomes the neutral. All right, so here's what we got to think about. Aluminum, if it becomes a cation, should be a positive three charge because it's on the diagonal, we remember plus three. If it's partnered with chloride, which is minus one, then it should be AlCl3. All right, that would be my aluminum with chloride balancing the charges. And hydrogen should become the neutral, but like we talked about, hydrogen is part of Hofrenkel. So this one is the only one we have to worry about for single displacement in that it will be a diatomic. So that'll be H2. So what I look at here is again, the metal that's on the right prefers to be neutral. The metal that's on the left prefers to be the cation. That wasn't how they started, right? And the way that I teach this uh, in intro to make it kind of easy to remember is going back to the series, the less active, the less active elements want to be alone. It's a little cliche, but it made it easy to remember for me. It's not active. It doesn't want to play. It wants to be off by itself. That's how I remembered it. So less active wants to be alone. So hydrogen, less active, wants to be alone. The aluminum, more active, wants to be with the buddy. So it goes with the chloride. Now, I have the correct products, putting a cation and an anion. I balance the charges together. The neutral hydrogen would be alone. It's just hydrogen is the exception here. It's a diatomic, so it's H2. But what I notice is now my reaction isn't balanced. So what I want to look at here is I got two hydrogens and three chlorines, but they're coming from the same place. So I need to think least common multiple, which would be a six. So if I have six HCLs, that would be six hydrogens. So I need a three in front of H2 to get six hydrogens and three chlorines times two would give me six chlorines. And that means I need two aluminums to make that balance. Now, in, in terms of the states, the ionic compound is always going to be aqueous and the neutral is always going to be a solid except hydrogen gas. That's the only one that we have to worry about here, that the hydrogen is part of Hofbrinkel, so it's diatomic and it'll be a gas. So in other words, if I put aluminum metal into hydrochloric acid, I'm gonna see bubbling like right, right away, right? So aluminum turned into the cation, the cation turned into the neutral. So let's try another one. I've got iron and copper to sulfate. So if I look at my series, right? Here's my iron, here's my copper. Iron is more active, copper is less active. All right, so copper, less active. Iron is more active. The less active wants to be alone. So the cation is going to become the neutral. So copper is now going to have no charge and it'll be a solid. And the neutral iron is now going to become the cation. Now here's the problem with type two cations. When I go to say, okay, iron is going to now be a positive ion, then I have to say, well, what charge is it? It's a type two cation. And I don't know what charge iron always is. And it's because it's not always the same thing. So you'd have to have a little bit of a note here, right? So this would have to be given on the test. I would say something like iron becomes a uh, plus two cation, right? Something you'd have to be given that information because otherwise there's no way for you to know. So iron plus two partnered with sulfate, negative two, this is gonna be aqueous. But the driver of this is that copper prefers to hold on to the electrons, right? Rather than iron. So copper actually steals electrons from iron. So if you see this reaction in lab, the iron is steel wool. So you have steel wool, it goes into this blue copper two sulfate solution. And with enough time, the steel wool looks like it's rusting because it turns like an orangey brown color. It's not rusting, that's copper that's depositing. 
it, so the copper that's in the solution is ripping off electrons from iron and turning into copper solid. And subsequently, the iron is dissolving into solution. So the steel wool is dissolving, but the copper is depositing on the steel wool. It's actually, I don't know, it's kind of cool because <laughs> it's just exchanging electrons. You can't see those. So it's a, it's a neat reaction. So what makes this redox is the fact that there's a charge change. So what I want to talk about here really quick is this change in charge. Iron starts out neutral and it turns into a cation. So if something is a neutral and it goes to a positive charge, that means that it has lost electrons. And with iron, we can tell it's lost two. It went from a zero to a positive two, it, lo it lost two negative particles. When you lose electrons, that is oxidation, right? So the iron here was oxidized. Now, the easiest way to remember this is the copper starts out as a positive two and becomes a zero. And what I always thought was made it simple is whatever reduces the charge is what's reduced. So copper here is reduced and technically it's because it gained electrons. But there's a mnemonic with tutoring. They always, they always give you oil rig. And I never really liked that mnemonic because what it stands for as oxidation is losing electrons, reduction is gaining electrons. Okay, that's nice. But what a lot of students then mistake is they think, oh, it's becoming positive. That means gaining. And it's the opposite. If it's becoming positive, it's because it's lost electrons. So to me, what always made it simple is whatever reduces its charge is reduced. That keeps it really simple. Copper's reduced. The charge goes from a plus two down to a zero. That's reduced. That means the iron is oxidized, right? So here's the other row um, with the terminology, whoever made the rules with this, honestly. Whatever is reduced is what's called the oxidizing agent. And whatever is oxidized is the reducing agent. All right, so why, why the confusion? <laughs> um, I think the, the, I understand it's what it means, right? If, if something is reduced, it's gaining electrons, which means it is the agent that allows for the other substance to be oxidized by receiving those electrons. Whatever is oxidized is releasing electrons, which is the agent that allows for the other substance to be reduced. I get it, but it just seems like it was, it's like purposely confusing, even though I don't think it is. Um, so here's what you wanna remember. Whatever reduces its charge is reduced and whatever's reduced is the oxidizing agent. Opposite, whatever releases electrons is oxidized. The charge is going up, becoming more positive. That's oxidation. And that whatever is oxidized, the iron in this case, is the reducing agent. So we got another example here. Um, we've got lead with sodium. Again, single displacement, metal with metal. We want to go to the activity series. And when I look here, I've got lead and I've got sodium. All right, so sodium is more active and the lead is less active. And what we remember is the less active wants to be alone, the more active wants to be in the compound. Since that's how these already are, less active lead is alone, more active sodium is in the compound, this is one where there would be no reaction. Remember how I said that was a possibility with single displacement? That, that would be the answer for this one. Don't ever predict products that don't happen. If I put lead solid into salt water, nothing will happen, right? So it, it would just stay lead solid. All right. Now, as I mentioned, we also can do single displacement with halogens. And with halogens, we're going to do this in lab. We're looking at the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. All right. And what they typically kind of talk about with halogens is the oxidizing power. So when it's asking you about a higher oxidizing power, that means it's more likely to be reduced, right? Because it's an oxidizing agent, so it's more likely to be reduced. 
So when you look at the halogens, um, fluorine is our strongest oxidizer. It loves to be fluoride. Um, in fact, fluorine is highly, highly unstable. So out of all of these, fluorine really wants to be fluoride. So if I'm looking at this in terms of the series, right? Fluorine is the most likely to be the anion. Iodine is the most likely to be the compound, the, the elemental zero charge, the neutral. So if I have NAF, where the fluoride here is a minus one, and the I2, which is in the elemental form, that's how they prefer to be. And so no reaction will occur. If I swap this though, fluorine, right? Fluorine prefers to be reduced. So fluorine is gonna become fluoride and the I is gonna become the I2. So in terms of the, I, the oxidizing power, it increases as we go up. So fluorine has the highest oxidizing power. It is the most likely to be the fluoride. Iodine has the lowest. So if I use that trend and do one more example here, let's say I start out with chlorine gas and I react it with sodium iodide solid. All right, looking at my trend here, chlorine would prefer to be compared to the iodide, would prefer, oops, I can't write anymore, would be, prefer to be the anion. So they should switch. The chlorine should go with the sodium, plus one, minus one. All right, and the iodine should be the I2. So they should switch. So the chlorine, the neutral, becomes the anion, and the anion becomes the neutral. So if I kind of dissect this, right, those monatomics, right, they have, we talked about that oxidation state is zero. And then we've got in the compound, they're minus one. So the minus one iodide going up to a zero, right, the charge has gone up, it's increased. That shows oxidation. It has lost electrons, lost negative. Whereas the chlorine went from a zero charge to a minus one charge, right? From zero to minus one, that shows the reduction because it has gained electrons, all right? So if I gave you this equation, I know it's not balanced, don't worry about that, but I said, okay, looking at this, what is the oxidizing agent? The agents are reactants. So if I ask you like oxidizing agent or the reducing agent, it's gotta be on the reactant side. So we're only looking at you know, this side to figure that out. The oxidizing agent is the substance that's reduced. So the chlorine here is reduced, charge goes down. So what I would answer here for that reaction is the oxidizing agent is the Cl2, right? That's what's reduced. The reducing agent, oops, in other words, what is oxidized is really the iodine, right? But we would put the sodium iodide, but really it's the iodide that is the agent for the reduction because it is what's oxidized. The sodium stays the same. Okay, 131, one minute over, that was a lot. That is the end of our chapter five notes. There's a lot of content there. There's a lot of videos to keep you busy for the next, well, as long as you wanna be. So when we meet back on Thursday, we'll be looking at chapter six. Um, but for now, that's a good place for me to stop. I'm sure y'all are tired. Um, so just let me know if you have any questions, but otherwise have a great week.